Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Economics Design Podcast. My name is Ari Kimmelman. I'm an analyst here with Economics Design. And today, I'm very excited to be speaking with Edward Tan from Hash Ventures. Edward, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Yeah, very happy to be here. I've followed economics design for a while now. Uh, ever since I think Lisa was doing a lot of like YouTube short videos um, on YouTube many years ago. So very happy to just be able to represent my team here to share a bit about our insight, uh, a bit of our background uh, and some of our thesis that we're looking at in the year forward. Um, yeah. Great. It's, yeah, it's great to have you here. Um, do you want to share a little bit about yourself, your background and how you got your current role at Hash? Yeah, yeah, I- I'm happy to do so. So I actually spent about years uh, in the UK, a couple of years back. That was for my university uh, and graduated from account- in accounting and finance, then started working for about three years in traditional finance. So this was in the most, uh, well, this was in the most stable asset class actually in real estate. Uh, so I was in real estate by side uh, for about three years. And that was purely to look at like venture side of things. Uh, you know, new technologies in the real estate space. So you're looking like prop tech uh, and then moving on to private equity. So where I worked on for uh, logistics and data centers. So in something that was yielding uh, in a very stable way, seven to eight percent a year, I moved on to the more back in the day, or you could also, you know, be making seven to eight percent in a month. So um, I found myself sort of exploring crypto uh, towards the, I saw, um, late 2020, um, and that was when I had a lot of free time on my own to really figure out what is this space doing. Uh, this was during the work from home days and also to, I think, uh, COVID where things were slowing down a lot for the real estate market as well. Um, and then I started posting, uh, started ramping up my presence on Twitter a little bit, uh, still am actually working on that, uh, and eventually started posting a lot of thoughts at short form pieces. Uh, but with a lot of these short form pieces, uh, you get a lot of DMs and questions on about a, a bunch of your insights, uh, why you think this way and why you feel this way about a certain ticker or a certain ecosystem. And that's where I started my Medium page. Uh, and I started writing a little bit more long term content based uh, backed by data. Um, there was a research file that was launched about three years ago. Uh, and that's where I sort of put a bunch of the things that I've already written uh, and submitted it for the research bounty, won that bounty, and then eventually uh, started getting a bit more traction in terms of like working full time with the space because funds started reaching out. Uh, people started DM some employers and asking like, hey, you know, I, I see on your bio that you are working full time in traditional finance, uh, but you're open to, you know, you're doing part time DGEN work. So are you open to working in crypto full time? And that's where I started uh, getting my bells ringing. I put on a few, uh, I, 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 I spoke to a few places and eventually settled with Hash uh, because I think that Hash is one of the, I mean, it's the largest South Korean VC um, and I'm very happy to like just share a little bit more about Hash. Uh, yeah, that'd be that, I think that you, okay, cool. Yeah, so um, Hash started in 2016 actually. So we've been around for about six to seven years now. Uh, and it's all founders capital. So it's a three co-founders that came together uh, after exiting from the different startups in the past. So these were not crypto startups. Uh, this were, they are all engineers by background, mechanical engineers, software engineers, game designers. Uh, three of them came together, uh, pulled money together on their own and started investing. Uh, this was public markets and then eventually decided to go on to uh, private markets. Uh, over time, uh, we expanded to outside of Korea. So in 2019, we opened our office in San Francisco. In 2021, uh, in Singapore, where I'm based right now. Uh, and then in early 2022, so just over a year ago, we opened up our office in So we have a uh, geographical presence in four different countries right now. Uh, and we are scaling it very actively. Uh, so in Southeast Asia, uh, myself and another colleague looks after that market. Uh, he is in Thailand. Uh, and we have one of our co-founding partners that's actually moving over from Korea to Singapore uh, later half of this year. So we are ramping up presence in Southeast Asia uh, and also in India, where we actually have a 15-man team right now. Yeah, Very exciting. Um, I, I like to hear that. I like to hear how you've transitioned from traditional finance now into decentralized finance. I think that's very exciting. Um, yeah. 
now that we've kind of laid out the groundwork for what is Hashed and your role there, um, I'd love to talk about some of the investments that Hashed has made. So I'm wondering if you could share some general information um, or any information pertaining to some recent investments that you're quite excited about from Hashed um, or any um, interesting research reports or articles that you've currently written about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I think that, uh, you know, at, at Hash, we, we are looking at, we are industry agnostic and we are also stage agnostic. So we are very open to any kind of narratives that are coming up, but as long as these narratives are long-term. Um, and so when we uh, do re our, our recent investments, most of these are not announced yet. Uh, I think the most recent one that we announced was Aura Network. Uh, this was a uh, 0.3, about 4 million fundraising round uh, led by us at Coin98 Ventures. Um, Aura is actually looking at um, focusing on an NFT a uh, global NFT scaling platform on Cosmos. So, you know, Cosmos is pretty fragmented, but what we saw is that there's a gap where there aren't any L1 chains uh, right now that focuses on NFTs. Uh, so we wanted to capitalize on the opportunity. And the thing that we really liked about the Aura team is that they are actually a team that has spun out of the largest conglomerate in Vietnam. Uh, it's called FPT Group. Uh, and they have you know, the, I, if they have 60,000 employees all over the world uh, and they're all focused on like engineering and tech, they even have universities uh, all over Vietnam uh, with 150,000 different students uh, focused on engineering. So there are uh, many of heavy tech focused uh, folks that have come out of this conglomerate to also spin out and work for Aura. Um, and we see a very strong team that has very strong local backing uh, mm -hmm. able to scale this uh, within this NFT space. And the approach that they're taking is actually not on like hitting mass user adoption uh, in a in a very direct manner. So many or many L1s, I think as they scale, uh, they try to see what's the best way to uh, acquire users from a B2C basis, like what's the fastest way. But they're actually going from to a uh, business to developer perspective to try to build infrastructure and tooling that makes it easy for developers to build on the L1 first. And then once you have that, uh, you will eventually get decks that are uh, able to attract many users on a mass basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, reset. Um, so that's one of the things. Yeah, sorry. So um, that's one of the things that we're looking at. Uh, there's also another deal that we recently closed unannounced uh, that is trying to create new enemy IPs with top manga cars and enemy creators. So this project starts off as a crowdfunding platform with NFTs, and then eventually the idea is for them to transition into a platform that originate creation through a matching system where if I hold an NFT and I have certain ideas and I want to inter um, interact with like enemy creators to give them my ideas, is there a way for us to come up with a new enemy IP together that we can sort of scale, that we can sell, uh, that we can make merchandise out of? Uh, that's the second one. So it's it's I think the way we're looking at it is like, is there a way to hit mass adoption, uh, the next billion users, uh, in a way that uh, people are already familiar with? Um, yeah. Very interesting. Um, you know, we've we've spoken now about blockchain um, data twice on the podcast so far. We recently had the uh, CEO, um, Ganesh of Covalent, come on. It, it was a very educational session in which we really learned how blockchain data is a tremendous future of what will dictate the development of projects. I think that's a very exciting topic. And I also noticed that quite a few of the hashed investments is also on the topic of um, forms of data infrastructure or rather blockchain and analytics. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about um, those investments, uh, looking at how you believe infrastructure and data science and data analytics will help shape the future of uh, Web3. Yeah, yeah um, I think that the beauty about blockchain is that it's completely transparent. Uh, it is meant to be readable by everybody, auditable by everybody, um, and it makes everyone accountable, right? So um, data is the precipice of what uh, many of these steps are building up on, uh, what users are relying on, whether you are a worker in the space, whether you're just try someone trying to make money out of the space, um, data is pretty much your, uh, your you should be your bread and butter. So I think that um, when you look at folks like Nansen, you, Arkham Intelligence, they are the ones that are piece, piecing um, a lot of these data together to make it in a very readable format for a retail user to use. Like, how can I make use of this transparency that's given by the blockchain 
and put it into my uh, uh and make it ROI for me. like how how do I make it work for me? So I think that uh we are always looking for these infrastructure platforms that are able to bridge that gap between what is given by the blockchain as uh as a matter of like uh, of of its existence yeah. and making it readable for funds to trade for uh make it readable for people who want to trade NFTs people who want to uh be earned into a particular ecosystem or a protocol right so so we see we see data as something that is super important uh but it is not today the most widely used uh item mainly because people don't know how to use it people don't know how to make the most out of it uh and essentially if you have something like dude uh, and i don't know how to code i don't know how to use sql how then can i make sure uh how then can i like find out let's say who are the biggest liquid staking derivative protocols out there um in, in a sense that okay i want to know uh, are these um uh, um like how many people have staked with the beacon chain contract for example yeah mm-hmm. yeah um i'd love to i'd love to learn a little bit more about how vesting schedules work um, within the context of hash investments. So, I mean, I've read several white papers in the past, and there seems to be trends across time of how vesting schedules are designed, and that differs depending on what type of industry within the Web3 space that is, whether that's something like, um, you know, GameFi or a DeFi protocol. So I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about how Hashed and yourself thinks about these vesting schedules, and even, even when you're perhaps negotiating these with founders on how you go about that process? Yeah, um, really good question. Um, I think for vesting schedules, there are essentially a couple of things to consider, but the most important one is uh, boils down to circulating supply. So I think in the early days, uh, when most of these companies, uh, at these prominent companies that we see today, and when I say early days, it could be as much as about two and a half years ago, so late 2020, mid 2020, when a lot of these protocols were first raising, uh, they will go through equity. Um, and this equity comes with a token warrant. We see a lot of that still today. But back then, because you don't know how to go straight into raising through a SAFT, which is um, uh, essentially raising with a token, uh, you will go through equity and then eventually have that warrant of issuing a token. Um, and then there was a lot of discussions or little consideration as to how we should structure our vesting schedules. So you will see a bunch of tokens that are, that are getting unlocked two years down the road uh, with a huge uh, hit on the circulating supply. So today, when we look at vesting schedules, or at least when we talk to portfolio companies uh, before we enter fundraising round uh, with them, it's about asking, okay, um, let's say I raise a uh, 5 million F50, F50 million valuation. That means that um, that 5 million uh, 10% of my tokens uh, will be vested uh, by the time the clip ends. Um, and let's give an example. Maybe we do like a 12-month cliff and 12-month monthly vesting. So by the end of a year, uh, after TG, you will have tw- uh, 10% of your circulating supply, uh, sorry, of your total token supply hitting the market. Um, but it's not all of that 10% because then it's vested over 12 months. So it's one twelve of that 10%. So let's just take an example uh, for simplicity, like 1% of your total token supply will be hitting the market in a year from now. Um, and, and that has to, you have to measure that 1% of your total t- supply against your current circulating supply at a point in time. Does that make sense? So you, you want to you wanna look at the rest of your token supply and see, okay, maybe I have some use for token emissions. Maybe I have some use for uh, marketing. Maybe I have some news for uh, investors and advisors. What is the vesting schedule for for these folks, uh, uh, for these different brackets, such that I can have a rough idea of what my circulating supply is at that point in time. So after a year, if my circulating supply is, you know, uh, let's say 10% of my total supply. So that's already hit the market. 100 million tokens out of 1 billion tokens have already hit the market. If I have 1% of my token supply, going to enter the market, uh, that will make it 10 million tokens. That will actually be 10% of my circulating supply at that point in time. So 10 million tokens being released out of 100 million tokens that are already released. And that could be quite significant. So I I, I would want to be a little bit wary of that. Um, and so if the conversation changes, and let's say today, 
um, I'm not able to raise five. Maybe suddenly my uh, need um, to raise five million has dropped. Uh, so I only need to raise three million. Then that could actually reduce the vesting schedule because what what it means is that there will be less the uh, there will be less tokens being unlocked at the end of the vesting, and so I'm more than happy to reduce that vesting schedule. Uh, because there's just fewer fewer amounts that I will have to release at that point in time. Yeah, mm. that's that's interesting. And um, on the topic, I guess of researching different types of token models, and as well as the projects that you and your team invest in. I'd like to learn a little bit more about the types of um, research methodologies that are used. So for example, if there's a specific platform like Dune Analytics that you think is more favorable over another, um, or um, certain types of frameworks that you apply in your research methods, I'm wondering if you could speak to that point. Yeah, um, I think everybody in our team has different approaches to researching. Uh, ultimately, it depends on how you, uh, I guess ultimately it depends on the topic. So when I did an internal paper for my team on liquid staking derivatives a couple of weeks ago, um, it was using a bunch of different data points. So we were looking at, uh, so I mentioned this uh, earlier part as well, where we were looking at, okay, um, which protocols are around as liquid staking derivatives today? Uh, and, and to be able to see that, we needed to scan through, let's say, a, pro, uh, a platform like DeFi Lama where we look at the number of liquid staking protocols, uh, what the TDL is, and, and essentially going into each of them and then looking at their token model to understand what is the underlying liquid staking derivative that's involved. When I say that, it's, uh, I'm referring to like your stake ETH for Lido, uh, your RETH for Rocket Pool, uh, and you have a few different other protocols. And then also looking at the native governance token. So, if I'm looking at Lido, I want to understand the LDDO token. If I'm looking at Rocket Pool, I want to understand the RPL token. If I'm looking at Frax, I want to understand their uh, F -F 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 FXS token, right? Mm -hmm. So there are two different ways to look at it. And most of it is like understanding the protocol itself. I didn't, uh, and, and I also ended up using Dune because they had a bunch of very, very useful dashboards um, that told me how many ETH is currently staked with the beacon chain today. So we were looking at like 15%, if I recall correctly. Um, at least that was the case back then. Uh, and then within that 50%, how is that distributed across the different liquid staking derivatives? But that's just one segment of it. Uh, there's also centralized players like Coinbase, um, Binance, uh, and, and these are your, your sexes that offer staking, uh, staking services. And then you have your third party node operator like Sigmund, DSRV, Block Payment. Uh, these are big folks that take your uh, they could take it. So there are, there are many different areas and with June, I could aid, I was able to dissect that even though I, I don't know coding myself, but because there are already dashboards available in a very readable format, uh, I was able to uh, ex uh, pull out some of these key insights. Yeah. And and when you're performing this research and you're having these conversations with your coworkers, um, how does that how does that conversation usually look like? Is it usually a collaborative effort? Is it more of an individual effort? And um, what what does that look like? Yeah, um, so it depends. Uh, in, in this case, uh, the research was prepared by myself uh, and then I shared it with the rest of my team over a one-hour session. Uh, and this was in person where, you know, while we have folks based in US, we have folks based in Singapore, we have folks based in Thailand uh, and folks based in Seoul, uh, we all flew in together for an investment team offsite. Uh, and it was during that offsite where I shared this with the rest of my team uh, otherwise, on a day-to-day -day basis, it would have been over a Zoom call where, you know, we do like a 30-minute, 45-minute presentation, uh, and then we take the last 15 minutes to dish out Q&A for each other. So so when we look at research, uh, we actually come up with uh, a little uh, calendar where on a weekly basis, we have one of us presenting this to the rest of the team. Uh, and when I say this, it could be a protocol, it could be a token, it could be an ecosystem. It could be a narrative. Uh, we want to know and keep ourselves updated as venture as venture funds because our <clears throat> we have different vehicles that we invest out of, uh, and we have different uh, like it's not just investing that we focus on. And happy to share a little bit more about that later on. Uh, but uh, we when we look at an investment vehicle, we look at venture stuff. So we look at primary deals. Uh, but to understand 
the innovations that are coming out of primary deals, we need to have a good understanding of the secondary market. What are protocols that are already operating in the space? What is their token model? Uh, what, what market have they already captured? And then when this new company comes and pitches to us, we have a good idea of um, like what is their USP, what's their selling point, uh, and how, how can they differentiate from existing players. Mm-hmm. And, and so when it, when it comes to, for example, different projects um, sending you slide decks or sending your team slide decks, is this, um, is this a primary part of your primary role? Um, is this something that you do alongside the team or is, or is it something a little bit different as an associate slash research role? Yep. Um, great, great question. I think that uh, when it comes to deal sourcing, uh, it's always a very tricky thing because uh, as a fund that's been around for about six years, uh, deal flow isn't isn't a problem, but it's about deal filtering, like making sure we uh, land on the right deals to spend a lot more time on. Uh, and that's something that we are also working on in terms of how well can we filter this. Like if we look at a pitch deck um, and it comes to uh, how, and, and let's say five pitch decks come out in, 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 in like a week. Sometimes it's more than that, like eight to 10 in a week. How then do we pick the one or two that we focus a bit more on? Uh, yeah. And ultimately, I think it also depends on who has passed us that pitch deck. Um, we've, I think we found that a lot of those that come through LinkedIn uh, are not very great. Uh, but if you know, if you know one of us directly, uh, that helps a lot. So it could be from a referral from a friend that's already looking at this deal. Uh, it could be from a fund that's uh, already committed to this deal and looking for follow-ons. Then, then, then that's something, especially if it's a fund that we have co-invested with, or it could be something that we are spending a lot more time on is going to developer conferences. So in December, I was a judge for ETH India, uh, where there was, if I recall correctly, there was a um, thousand five hundred developers, um, and a, at a two day hackathon, so forty eight hours of pure hacking, and then twelve hour of uh, pitching. So there were 1,500 developers in a massive conference hall um, and all of them eventually made up to about 300 different teams, so 300 different pitches. Um, and uh, I was on a booth. Uh, there were 20 other booths out there where we spent about six hours just going back and forth with many of these pitches. So um, we are spending a lot more time going down on the ground to find out a lot more about what uh, early developers are building. What are they looking at that we are not seeing? Because they are the ones that are doing things from origination, right? From scratch, uh, growing ground up. So they know a lot more than us as we perhaps are looking from a, a top, top-down top perspective where we see certain narratives, we hear of certain narratives, um, and then we kind of look for certain companies. But if we know, uh, if we go on the ground and we speak to what developers are excited about, maybe we can help them scale beyond. Yeah, yeah that's, that's very interesting. Um, and I think... I like that approach and the way of thinking about that situation because when I think about blockchain technology and Web3, I get most excited about smart contract development and and basically coding is what I get most excited about as someone who is kind of learning my own coding. And I think that's really an exciting part of the future of this industry is that it's likely being led in a lot of senses by the computer science students and the data science people. That to me is a very cool innovation within the space. I'm very excited to see continue to grow um, I think just to make some cl- things clear here for our listeners, yeah. do you want to share um, how much money was raised uh, by Hash and as well as what round they prefer to invest in? Yep. Um, so Hash actually has, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's actually a prop capital fund uh, where eventually, uh, ultimately we started off as three co-founders coming together with their own money and then growing that stack. So yep. today we manage on, on the prop capital side uh, that's what we invest in uh, for token deals. Uh, when I say token deals, it means that if you're a company that's raising uh, uh, through a SAF, uh, and then that's where we would invest out of. But over the years, uh, being the most prominent in, in Korea, uh, we actually eventually started raising a ton. Uh, and this was for Korean conglomerates. Uh, in Korea, it's called Chables, uh, where you have LG, Samsung, Naver, Kakao, uh, the really big Korean conglomerates that reached out, out and said, okay, we want exposure to the crypto market. Uh, how, what is the best way for us to get exposure to the crypto market without having to spend too much time and effort on it? Uh, maybe because there's just not much. Uh, it is a very niche market, as you would know by now. Um, and it's also one of those markets where uh, you do need to have uh, spend a lot of time and resources on it. So instead of that, 
uh, they reached out to us to do the investments for them. And so that's where we launched LP Fund 1, which is a 100 million fund, and that's been fully deployed. Um, in November 2021, we launched LP Fund 2. Uh, and Fund 2 was, so the first mandate was really on like just general crypto exposure. Uh, the second one was very much focused on entertainment. So when I say entertainment, it's about like uh, um, uh, similar to the one I just shared about about uh, the enemy, right? Creating uh, what has worked in the real world in the market, uh, and then taking those concepts and trying to bring it onto the blockchain. So you have enemies. Uh, a, a good example will be that uh, will be the enemy uh product or project where you host uh people that are creating enemies uh and very talented artists, very talented story writers. Uh, that are creating enemies, but then when it comes to distribution, they will have to go to a middleman, a distribution party, to help them distribute it. And at the end of the day, once this becomes a global hit, uh, the revenues that they receive is actually very minuscule, um, or at least it's not commensurate to the amount of talent and time and money that they have spent on this. Um, so this enemy uh, is actually creating this crowdfunding platform that helps to bridge the gap, or at least get rid of the middleman, so that the original creators and the I the, the the ones that came up with that IP uh do get most of the credit at the end of the day. So um uh that was the mandate for LP fund two and there's a two hundred million fund. So we've got three vehicles that we tend to invest out of our prop capital fund, uh typically token, uh LP fund one hundred million which we fit close already, uh close and fully deployed, two hundred million fund which we have uh deployed about seventy seventy percent of it. So yeah. And and about with and regarding the second fund there, um, when it comes to negotiating between tokens versus equity versus some combination yeah. about the two, um, how yeah. does that typically work? Yeah, so so to make sure that there's no conflict of interest between these three vehicles, uh, prop capital only invests in token, while the other two LP funds only invest in equity. Mm, and okay. if the company, if the project decides to launch a token later on, uh, that's a that's for a future discussion. But at the point in time of investment, it's only equity. And what do you, in your experience, um, do you, what, what do you sense in terms of investing in tokens versus investing in equity? How do you think that's played out um, in terms of its success the past pre the previous couple of years? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, it's a very distinct uh, shift uh, that we have seen in the past, I would say, one and a half years. So when you look at 2021, a uh, large number of projects were actually investing in tokens. Uh, and when, when token meaning uh, pure sub, and the, the reason for that is because it's the easiest to monetize and it's the quickest to liquidity. So if I'm a company and I'm a project founder, um, how's, what's the fastest way for me to hit, uh, get, get money for my project and be able to, not, not, not like I'm looking to exit, but rather be able to make, uh, this, make my time and my uh, effort worth uh, and, and like sort of make it hit fruition. Um, so so the, you, you could look at a time frame of as short as six months. Where the moment I close this deal, uh, my TGE hits in six months, and in a bull market, uh, a TGE could actually easily um, 10x, 20x uh, by the time it hits uh, the to the token TGE. And when you look at 10x or 20x, so let's say I as a founding team um, has a six month clear, right? Um, this is a very extreme example. So if I have a six month clear, then I'm able to uh, let's say unlock 10% of my tokens. Uh, by the end of six months. If I ship a 10x, I'm basically break even, right? As in for, for an investor, uh, for a team, I, I basically made uh, 10x out of my out of my time and effort that I've spent because these are team tokens that are allocated to me for my time and effort. So as a founder, maybe that's something I'm thinking about. Like I want to be able to make, uh, like, mm -hmm. like liquidity as soon as possible. And you are able to do that in a very long, like bull market also without dampening the, the cost of the project or the impact on the project uh, because there's not like low liquidity problems. Mm. Uh, in a bear market or in like in a uh, sort of trending uh, cramp market, uh, we actually see a difference where founders are spending a lot more time on thinking about how to design their book products. Um, and so in order to give them that buffer, and the leeway at that time while building out their project, they actually raise through equity first and then come up with an equity plus token warrant in the future when they have come up with a very good token design and then eventually launch the token. And I just want to make something very clear here. 
Uh, I, I get nervous when I hear the words 10x and 20x. I don't want to guide our yeah. listeners, to guess the listeners the wrong way. Yeah. Uh, there's there's unfortunately too many scams in this in this space to make sure, an sure. 10x a a uh, likely probable or a probable probable event. But um, yeah. let's let's keep going. So um, I have a question in terms of I guess a success versus failures uh, of certain investments. I mean, at this point, you've mentioned that for the uh, for the second fund that you had mentioned. All the funds have already been all the hundred million has already been deployed into investments. Um, so I'm wondering, in terms of keeping track of, for example, what type of investment has been more fruitful compared to others, is this information that perhaps tries that venture capital firms within the space have a tendency to want to keep on the down low? Is this information that people have public access to? How does this typical typically work? Yeah, uh, yeah. So um, it's it's a really good question again because um, I think you're hitting the points where a lot of funds. Like especially when you're mature, uh, you know you have run your fund for about four or five years now, um, and you're looking for ways to uh, make things a lot more structured and organized. So about one and a half years ago, we set up our platform team. Uh, so kudos to the uh to the guys. Um, he's actually also called Edward. Um, uh, and he leads the team in in Korea. Uh, and and it's a four man team right now. Uh, extremely clever, extremely talented, extremely hardworking and structured folks um, where they really look at everything post-investment for us. So the moment our, in, so I'm based in, I, I'm set an investment team. We do everything from deal sourcing, uh, DD, uh, deep diving, reference checks, uh, and and until deal, the whole the whole deal execution process and wiring. So the moment we hit, it hits the wire, um, the part of responsibilities actually then move on to the invest. The post investment team, we call it our platform team, where they will manage everything from, you know, if you need PR, if you need marketing, if you need hiring, and internal structuring. So we have um, an internal calendar that lets us know, okay, today, what kind of vesting schedules, uh, sorry, what kind of tokens are potentially out going to vest. But it's, I mean, it, it's, it, you're able to dissect on a daily basis, but on a monthly basis, it makes a lot more sense, or even a weekly basis. So, you know, you, you scroll in today. Uh, we have a calendar in our internal dashboard that tells us, okay, you've got this project that will be investing uh, next week. Um, you've got this project that will be investing two weeks time. Uh, and so we are then able to see also like, um, it, it then boils down to like how uh, exposed you are to a certain project at this point in time uh, or a certain vertical at this point in time. Because we have about 150 uh, live companies right now, uh, a bunch of them, and some of them are equity, some of them are token. Uh, so it's actually very important for us to be able to keep track, uh, like the exposure that we have to a certain fee vertical, um, and also the kind of tokens that we'll be investing at this point in time, because depending on, you know, market climate and liquidity, uh, volume, how are we able to, uh, either, uh, sort of double down on this particular vertical or even liquidate for this, this, uh, this space. And, and I guess my next question here on that point is. In terms of the relationships between you and your team and these founders of the plentiful number of projects you and your team have now invested in, um, how does how does that typically work? Is it you, obviously there's a lot of people and a lot of projects out there? Um, is it more of a you give your investment and then you take a little bit of a back seat, or is this a little bit more of a hands on helping the team build their project? Yeah, it's um. So for us, we actually try to spend a lot of time uh, working with the team. Um, and when I say a lot of time. It actually reflects in our the way we approach investments as well. Uh, that means that we try to take the lead stake in an investment. Uh, it, we are not as sensitive to valuation as we are to kind of ownership in this company. And ownership comes in the form of like token supply, uh, or in form of equity, which means comes with a board seat, uh, ability to make uh, decisions on a senior level together with the management. So we really try to have a hands-on approach with the team, um, everything from that DD phase all the way to post investment. So for our network, for example, we recently did a private session uh, with them. We hosted them in Korea. Uh, so they are a Vietnamese team, but we got them to host their main net launch in Korea about a week or two ago. Um, and this was a very close session for senior folks both in Korea, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, where they were in charge of getting these close invitees, uh, uh, sorry, close participants invited to the event. Uh, and then we will help with the logistics. We hosted them in our office. It's a very nice lounge. Uh, and, and essentially did a presentation from 
uh, the FPT Group Chairman, uh, the Aura Network CEO, and from our founding partner who was in charge of building this. So it's it's about making sure that we give them the support that they need to uh, execute uh, in terms of marketing, in terms of visibility, and in terms of that scaling in our local jurisdiction. So we are that that again we are one of the largest players in Korea. So helping them hit this Korean market, especially if it's relatable to them, uh, relatable to the users like NFTs, gaming, entertainment. Uh, then we want to try let them tap on that uh, advantage. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, in your experience doing your research and as well as having several of these conversations with founders and with your team members, I'm wondering if you could share about what skills you think are really useful. Um, so for example, um, if you find yourself in a little bit of a pinch and you say, oh shoot, I wish I had that skill or I learned that skill two years ago. Um, I'm wondering for younger people who are interested in yeah, not necessarily venture capital, but to become, should they spend their time becoming a wizard in Dune? Should they spend their time understanding data science and applying that to tokenomic models? How do you, how would you suggest young people ap uh, apply to the space? To the space, um, and I was very lucky in the sense that uh, it was, it was, um, you know, it was because out of I was really interested in like exploring these areas that eventually let me do this space. So if I were to look back, some skills that would really help is to, you can't force an interest, uh, but you can sort of like curate or nurture to see whether this is an area for you. And the beauty about crypto is that there are multiple areas. So many people have found their footing in different like niches, uh, different sub segments of the space. So I came from TradVive. Um, and, you know, I was used to the terms of lending and borrowing exchanges. I was trading options in my own time. Uh, and I was also looking at like, uh, you know, financial modeling for different real estate plots. Um, how then could, did I sort of find myself in the space? Because it was during the by summer and you had Aave, you had Sushi, you had Curve, you had Compound, you had Uniswap coming together. Um, and you have a bunch of different models, but ultimately things like Aave were allowing you to get loans, um, without KYC, permissionless loans, uh, as long as you had collateral to put down. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to get involved in this space. So I was already, so I already had BC at E on my own, but I wasn't doing anything with it. So then I found this protocol, which was completely permissionless. I didn't have to give them anything about my identity. All I had to do was connect my wallet. I deposited one BDC, one ETH in, uh, um, basically getting deposits, right? I started getting yield on my deposits, just like from the normal bank account. But then I could take out a loan of it. Uh, so it's over collateralized loan, obviously. So this is a difference between what we have at traditional finance where they use credit scoring um, and reputation versus something like here where it's still unable. We haven't come up with uh, with a very solid solution to enable under collateralized loans. Um, but anyway, it, it still achieved my purpose of being able to get a liquidity out of my assets, which I was putting on. So imagine something like an Apple stock. Um, you want to hold it. Uh, you're bullish on Apple for the next five to ten years, uh, but you're unable to do anything more of it. So it takes takes what we know in traditional world, uh, and it adds a layer on top of it. Um, so I, I found myself interacting with a lot of these protocols, uh, on on chain, uh, and eventually, you know, when I speak to funds, uh, and they ask me about my thoughts, uh, about this particular space or this particular protocol, you're able to articulate in a very uh efficient way. Uh, mainly because you have used those protocols before and you know exactly uh, that UI UX, but more than that, you know exactly the flow. How I, how will yeah. you make money? Uh, so, and I think that's that's really important for a protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, so I, I know that quite a few investments that Hash has made in the past has been these DeFi protocols or things related to decentralized finance. Maybe you could speak to one or two of those um, investments or things that you see as interesting technologies that can not necessarily solve the solution of over collateralized loans um, in the context of a, a standard DeFi protocol, but maybe some interesting um, innovations that you are keeping an eye out for. Yeah, um, I think that something very recently, uh, and I say recent meaning about the part, within the past six to nine months uh, that took off would be the decentralized purpose phase. So um, this is, and you know, when you look at the crypto derivatives, uh, actually. Crypto derivatives are dominant in terms of trading volume compared to any other 
uh, I guess compared to sport, right? Sport training volumes. Uh, we are looking at as of March 2023, total trainer in trading volume for crypto derivatives. Uh, and that is about two times more than what sport is trading at. Uh, and just sorry, just that is your total trading volume. Edward, do you want to just briefly explain what derivative versus the spot traders? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so I guess derivatives is just uh, leverage trading. Uh, spot trading is just uh, trading. Um, let's say I, I want to buy one BTC. I need to give you, uh, I, I need to take you to 20, 20K today. So that that is one. But let's say I'm really bullish on BTC um, and I'll, I can I can either buy an option on BTC, which is, um, uh, I guess in short, it's a call option where you, you put a certain premium down for a future payout that you can get uh, at a later stage. So that's got to do with time. Or you can buy perps on Binance uh, where you can level up 2x, 3x, um, where you put down 20k, but then you actually essentially have a 3 BTC position. But this means that if BTC's price go down to a certain amount, uh, you're able, you're going to get liquidated. So the good thing about spot trading is that you'll never get liquidated. It's marked to market based on BTC's price. Um, the thing about derivatives is that it's high upside, but it's also higher downside in a very big volatility event. So, um, so going back to it, uh, you have derivatives that are dominating spot trading volumes. Many people are looking at how to get my upside or how to trade derivatives to hedge my positions, for example, if I have certain spot positions. Uh, but a lot of these are on centralized platforms. You're talking about futures on Binance, options on the derivative um and very few i think it's about 0.1 percent or 0.13 percent uh on decentralized exchanges um and that just shows that there's a very big area of growth for decentralized derivatives out of the whole crypto derivative space um that being said if we look at the two just extracting d5 uh i think d5 is going in about I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but like maybe 60 billion in TBL. Uh there's about five five billion uh that are that are relating to the decentralized derivative space. Oh, sorry, no, wrong. Um well I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but like it's five percent of D5 that is captured by the decentralized derivative space. So um that is something that we are looking at because it was sort of spearheaded by innovations like GMX, where GMX in uh, operating on a shared pool counterparty liquidity model um, instead of order book model, which we see for DYDX, um, which we see on centralized exchanges where you essentially say, okay, I want to leverage long uh, 3x BTC, uh, but I want to wait for BTC to hit this price first. So I put in my leverage long limit position um, at this certain price. It may or may not hit, right? So that that is uh, that is the order book model. Uh, but then you have the shared pool liquidity model where you unlock capital efficiency um, and slippage free for traders. Maybe I want a leverage long BTC today. Um, I can do it against the pool. And this pool is done, is uh, contributed by you and I. Anybody who wants yield on their assets. It's a basket of assets that is 50% stables, 50% um, blue chip assets. Could be BDC, ETH, could be BDC, BNB, and ETH, could be BDC, Avalanche, and ETH. Right? So on different chains, they will have different basket of assets. And so as a liquidity provider, I'm only looking at this um, asset uh, so as like a pseudo ETF. Maybe I kind of bullish in the mid to long term and I don't buy uh, putting 10K down on, let's say, 5K stables, 5K blue chip assets. So I don't mind doing that. I contribute that to the liquidity pool, which traders will trade in and out of. So this model works such that if traders win, they extract from the pool. If traders lose, they contribute their amount to the pool. So it's it's one of those that uh sort of uh took the world by storm. Uh and I think it was also it helped a lot and its narrative was accelerated by the, the downfall of a lot of centralized exchanges. So you had your FTX, you had your 3AC, you had your Celsius Voyager all going down. And so most people were starting to distrust um centralized exchanges or centralized platform. So then how can I take directional trades in a decentralized manner? So this is an area of uh, with a DeFi that we are spending a little bit more time on and just trying to see whether it has room for scale. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that sounds like an interesting uh, field of research or um, a focus. I think that in terms of overarching narratives and, and thought processes of the crypto space, I, I started a blockchain club at my university. And one of the challenging things I've found is 
when people walk by and I have my booth set up set up with the blockchain club, um, explaining to people why a cryptocurrency, you know, is not a scam, in inherently not a scam. And and I think going back to the fundamentals here and thinking about what the average person knows um, or is a, at least interested in, um, it's it's um, it's quite distant from the um, advanced mathematics and statistics that are involved in decentralized lending and designing these uh, really complex, in some senses, um, ecosystems within the Web3 space. So very excited to see how this can, continues to grow um, in the future. Yep. yep, likewise. And and thanks a lot, Ari, for these questions. I think it's uh, very meaningful uh, and very helpful for getting, giving, I think, people who want to enter the space some visibility over what uh, more established uh, folks uh, have, already looked, have already looked at. I mean, that includes myself, right? Like I'm in this space to learn. Uh, it, to contribute in my own way, but also to learn from folks that have been around for a longer period, have seen multiple cycles, uh, and be able to essentially uh, see how they interpret these narratives from a longer short term basis. Mm -hmm. um, well, with that said, it was awesome having you on the podcast today, Edward. Thanks so much for coming on. Um, it's great to learn more about how Hashed works and your role at Hashed. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ari, for... Uh, for organizing this. Okay, thanks everyone for tuning in. Have a great week, everyone.